Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Strand. My name is Sabir. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after 92 years, Strand is a sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, still housing new and used books, and still running near 400 events a year. Tonight, we're excited to welcome Ben Catcher to the Rare Book Room. We're celebrating the release of Ben's new book, The Dairy Restaurant. Ben is the author of The Cardboard Valise, The Jew of New York, Julius Nipple, Real Estate Photographer, The Beauty Supply District, and several works of musical theater with the composer Mark Malaki. He teaches at Parsons, the New School for Design, and has contributed to The New Yorker, The Forward, Metropolis. And he's the first cartoonist to receive a MacArthur Fellowship. He's also the subject of the documentary, The Pleasures of Urban Decay. <laughs> Joining Ben tonight is Fran Lebowitz. Once named one of the year's most stylish women by Vanity Fair, Fran stands out as one of our most insightful social commentators. Her first book, Metropolitan Life, was a bestseller, as was her second collection of essays, Social Studies. Fran is also the author of the children's book, Mr. Chass and Lisa Sue Meet the Pandas. The subject, oh, sorry. The subject of the documentary directed by Martin Scorsese, Public Speaking. Fran has long been a regular on various talk shows, including those hosted by Jimmy Fallon, Conan O'Brien, and Bill Maher. Fran lives in New York City, as she does not believe that she would be allowed to live anywhere else. <laughs> so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ben and Fran to The Strand. Finally, I'm a lifeguard. Yeah, finally. <laughs> my, my childhood dream. Is that on? Yeah. So I was just asking Fran um, uh, how you know my, do you know my comics? Or my, I know I once saw you at one of these strange operas that I did, but, but I didn't know you were also reading comics. No, the first time I uh, read you was there was a little newspaper like called the New York Weekly or the press New York, New York press, New York press. Maybe, yeah. yes um, and that's where I first like saw your work um, you may or may not recall this but I called you once um, oh right about that book right right right, right. I called you book. like I saw I wrote a children's book called Mr. Chaz and Lisa Sue Meet the Pandas um, it was published by Knopf not exactly the most like you know, open to anything publishing house in New York. They did ask me, who would you like to illustrate this? They gave me a list of, you know, famous children's book illustrators. I said, well, do you know who Ben Ketcher is? No. Um, so I, she said, well, you can, uh, you can uh, ask him to audition, to make some drawings, and then we'll see. So I called him out of the blue, and he said, I, don't, I know who you are, but I don't really know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then we talked about it, and you said, you know, I wrote a children's book once, but no one would publish it. Who? Oh. You. You said this to me. Oh, no, I thought about writing one. Oh, right. I thought you did. And I said, why yeah. uh, wouldn't they publish it? You said, I don't know. I said, what was it about? And you said, all the children were cigarettes. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, it involved a, uh, the smell, a man who smelled of cigars. And, I, and they said, you can't have smoking in a... Children's, children's book. book. So, uh, yeah, that was the end of my interest in. So he made some drawings. I sent him the manuscript. He made the drawings. I love them. Knopf hated them right. and said to me, I still have them. Knopf said to me, Look, there's two, there, there, most of the beings in this book are pandas. There are two people, there are two children. There's a little girl, she is white, and a little boy, he is black. The, both the children look like little old Jewish men. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I have news for you. All people, no matter what their race, gender, or ethnicity, in old age, look like little old Jewish men. <laughs> so, so do some children. Yes. It's very interesting. It's true. The kind of child that looks like an elderly. Oh. Yeah. Is this not on? Yeah, there's, there's a, is that on? Yeah. There's a kind of 
child that sort of, I, I often see little girls and they look like my grandmother. I don't know, they're not that, they don't have that disease where they age, but they just have the demeanor. They're like uh, these small so little, but anyway. Because little girls at, at very, sometimes early age, understand what's in store for them. And they just collapse into being old women. <laughs> they skip the horrible part. Yeah. No, there's a kind of, they're like, they have the relaxation of an older person sometimes. Or something, the demeanor of an older person. But anyway, so, um, so what happened? So, uh, I think you probably want to talk about the dairy restaurant. Yeah, we could yes. talk about that a little bit. <laughs> so I don't know, I guess since it just came out, very few people have read this book or even looked at it. And it's not a book you have to read cover to cover. It's more like a phone book. You should consult it, look at the pictures and say, what is this about? And then, because it's a very, uh, it's a worldwide history. It's an you know, insanely pretentious thing to try to think I could write about everything in the world, but it is. It's everything. I read You've the book. Read it. Yeah. Yes, I read the so, book. Well worth reading. Yeah. And the like. It's uh, someone said to me, "What are you reading?" I said, "I'm reading this book by Ben Kedger called The Dairy Restaurant." So first, I had to tell this person what a dairy restaurant was, because you have to be at least as old as I am. Uh, most people who know what it is are dead. Um, you, uh, and you. Ha then I had to kind of describe it, uh, what a dairy restaurant was, and the last like hundred pages are like a directory, a list, of all the dairy restaurants in New York. And to me, the favorite part of reading this was you also no, uh, noted when the two brothers fought and split into two different restaurants. <laughs> like, so this, to me, is really the history of the Jews. The history of the Jews is the guy's in business with his brother, they have a fight, and then there's two restaurants. You know, and this is pretty much the history of the Jews. Um, yeah. And then at a certain well, point, they disappear, and they either become Gentiles right. um, or crazy Jews, which is what, well, I, whenever I say crazy Jews, Gentiles always say, what do you mean? They're so careful not to call the crazy Jews the crazy Jews. Um, I always say, you know, the crazy Jews, meaning the very religious Jews. They say, well, what's not a crazy Jew? I'm not a crazy Jew. What's not a crazy Jew? A crazy, not a crazy Jew is a regular Jew. A regular Jew is an atheist. <laughs> well, Who confines your Judaism to food. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in researching the, this book, and anybody who looks at the history of people who considered themselves Jews in any way, you realize they were all over the world in every culture and were partook of every culture and were co very different. I mean, especially once they left behind a common denominator of a language or a religion. Uh, so um, the di prob one of the problems with this book, if somebody living today thinks they're in this kind of unified Jewish community, they're going to be say, well, why don't you talk about my community? You left my community out. And that's because it all fractures by the time they come to America. And uh, since I'm not, uh, the end of the book is sort of autobiographical. It's about my encounters with these places. And so they're about the kind of Jew I am, which is a very specific kind. And um, uh, so yeah, I mean the breaking up of partnerships is you know a lot of um, anti-Semitism between Jews on very interesting levels of you know and uh, that all comes out in the history, people making fun of other kinds of Jews or not liking to associate with them. So um, hence Temple Emmanuel. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. It's a compl it's a m complicated issue, but. Um, the, and there's a book, this, and it's in a series that seems like this is certifiable Jewish culture. It's called like Jewish Encounters, and it's by this uh, venerable Jewish publishing house. And um, a few years ago, they just reissued one of their books called Jews and Power. Um, by a woman who I actually quote in this book because she was a pretty important um, scholar of Yiddish literature. 
and it's kind of the op. I don't, I don't have to mention her name. It's a book called Jews in Power. You can look it up. Um, but it's kind of the opposite of this book in that it's saying uh, the kind of character I describe, the Milichtika personality, the dairy personality. <laughs> That's too, after the Holocaust, that can't exist. Jews have to be as mean as everybody. They can't be lost in, in um, this kind of rumination, intellectual rumination, or doubt, self-doubt. It doesn't work in the modern world. So this is the corrective to Jews in power. This is Jews in dairy restaurants. <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, anybody who's interested, that's a very inside issue. Um, doesn't probably affect most people. <laughs> what, you mean the dairy restaurant or no, books? The, the idea of what a, people think Jews should be, the idea of what a Jewish community is or if it even should exist. Or, or Jewish unity or whatever. Well, I personally get very angry when um, something happens, uh, you know, involving the crazy Jews, and the media describes it as the Jewish community. Yeah. I always no, think, I mean, wait I a minute. I, no. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I like the idea that there are people who have um, all kinds of beliefs that I don't, that to me are like any mythology. I mean, I'm interested in mythology. So how somebody buys it and whatever the culture that um, goes with it. And, or somebody who wants to relive the time when science and um, religion and culture were all one. You know, they didn't uh, separate out into specialties. So if somebody wants to do that, that's, I mean, it has some bad ramifications. Yeah, but like say so, if you're a woman. Yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but. If you're uh, a woman, it has a lot of bad ramifications. Yeah, so, I mean, that's not the only one. It has a lot of other, stra other yeah, ramifications. If you are a woman, yeah. that's the main one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I see these people. Um, I know you're not supposed to call them these people. Um, but I see these people. I see these young women. They're like 24. They have two little kids. They have a kid in a stroller, and they're pregnant. And they're born here. And I think, how do they get these girls to do this? How do they get these girls to do this? And why do they specifically hate another group of people who do the same thing to women? Yeah. <laughs> right? uh -huh. The exact same thing. So if, yeah. you, if I was a man, I, I might have a different attitude, yeah. but no, I'm not. I, I know <laughs> something about, uh, my wife worked in a, um, a, uh, a Chabad school briefly. Now we're not, you don't have to be part of that uh, sector, but she worked there and I got to know some of these people. And um, the, the thing is a strange phenomenon, a phenomenon among the Hasidic, the little children who were born in America who have strong Yiddish, Yiddish accents. I know. Which to is me, amazing it is to me. It's hilarious, interesting. Right? What? To well, me, it's a y great Yiddish? phenomenon. I don't, it's not amazing. It's because they speak Yiddish at home. It's hilarious yeah. because to me, that's the language of grandparents. And yeah. Yiddish is also so physical that, you know, if you're walking behind those little kids and you see them going, to me, they're like little tiny grandparents. <laughs> they're like, like, you know, I you know, I went to see uh, Foot Around the Roof in Yiddish um, when it was first... I forget what this place is called, the Jewish oh, heritage yeah. thing yeah. downtown. And <clears throat> I, I went with Wally Sean, who's a playwright, um, who said to me, do you, do you understand Yiddish? I said, no. He said, well, they have subtitles. So we went, and of course, after two minutes, I wasn't reading the subtitles, you know, because you just have to hear the tone of voice, you have to hear, see the way they move, is completely understandable. It's a sign language, basically. Yeah. You know, I know there's a written version of it, which I can't read, but I find it very, not necessarily progressive, for little tiny American children to remind me of my Eastern European grandparents. Perhaps we can move forward. Uh, um, well, yeah, you could say, uh, I think part of the attraction of these dairy restaurants to me in this 60s, 70s, 80s, was that I knew these were the, la the remnant of this uh, culture in New York that wasn't going to continue in that way. And, um, and yeah, I sort of 
look toward things about it I like, like the food, people speaking Yiddish, um, the politics connected with a lot of it interested me too. So uh, I mean, the yeah, so, I got, the socialists. I, yeah, and yeah, the, the whole socialist history, um, uh, and also the Yiddish communists, you know, with a small C. That that was a whole culture that sort of uh, tried to exist um, parallel to this culture. Uh, but I, I found this funny: the Pew uh, Charitable trust or the Pew Research Center does these surveys about what does it mean to be Jewish. I, I'm not sure why they do them. To just to keep to keep a sense of... Not a good reason. There's not yeah, a good reason for there's that. There's not a good no. reason. <laughs> but, the, but I was, look, this list, like num the highest percentage of what is an essential part of what being Jewish means to them is the top is remembering the Holocaust Next is leading an ethical, moral life. Um, there's a lot of others. Caring about Israel is number 43%. But way at the bottom, almost the last thing, is eating traditional <laughs> Jewish foods. 14%. So almost nobody. No, because they're that. lying. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't... You think some? Yeah. Yes, the I think they're lying. So you mean so all polls like this are? Fixed. I guess I don't know. I mean, as you can see, I'm not a young woman. No one's yeah. ever called me for a poll. I you once got now, called. I once got one of those. What is that famous? Um, they called me once. It was really shocking. The Gallup poll. So, yeah. The, Did yeah. you talk to them? Yeah, I answered, and but I never once in my life. So it happens. <laughs> but then I told them the truth. I mean, they asking me. Mainly questions about uh, political questions, who I would be interested yeah. But um, But anyway, the other angle of dairy restaurants that appealed to me was that I said, this is maybe the end of a Jewish working class um, culture. And all the, we were talking about this uh, when we met tonight. All of the owners of these restaurants just there was never one of their children to go into that business. It was too hard, um, and they had other aspirations. And I think that's you know led to certain bad things. Well, about, they wanted their know. sons to become doctors, yeah. who would then grow up to tell people, "Don't eat that." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't eat <laughs> it was sour cream. Very bad for you. <laughs> yeah, that's well. I, I talked to a few people, children of waiters, the head waiters, and it was kind of a pretty good job. I mean, they could send them to college. Well, college was cheaper. It was then. free also. It, well, it was yes. cheaper. They went. They didn't go to city college, but but they uh, they said, come and work in the restaurant in the summer, and you'll see how horrible it is. And this is something you don't want to do. And um, you know, that's in other parts of the world and among other cultures, I think running a restaurant is a perfectly good thing to do. But uh, not if you have to r literally run it and make the food and clean up, you know, but that's what these people did. They were not uh, running, they were not, they didn't have- This um, wasn't Danny Myers. Yeah, no, no, no not Danny no. Myers. No. So- um, I mean, did you used to go to Ratner's, the one yeah. on 2nd Avenue? No, more on Delancey, I didn't know. I'm sorry? Yeah, there were two. There were three. No, there were two Ratners. And yeah, so Rob was Ratners. Ports was south of Ratners. There was a place called Thou Brothers, which nobody remembers, then Rappaports, then the Ratners. There, there was a Ratners there. on 2nd Avenue next yeah. to the Fillmore. Anyway. Which I'm sure that when the Fillmore was in operation, yeah, was the there. waiters were really surprised that at 3 in the morning it was full of like rock fans and musicians. Right. And, but the waiters treated everyone the same. They threw the plates at you. They threw them at you. <laughs> like hoping, not yeah. hoping to get you. Well, yeah, that's um, the end of, uh, toward the end of the existence of these places, a lot of the waiters, the, their hearts were not in no, the waiting. That and, you know, if they were even, most of them were not Jewish. Most of the kitchen staff was black, Puerto Rican. And um, so uh, I guess the question is, what did... Um, Jews lose by not wanting to do this kind of work or menial work. 
I mean, I think writers and people who cartoonists, I still think of myself as doing a kind of physical work. I mean, it's not a... Really? I don't think a coal miner would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't think of my... I didn't want to... Um, I think it's in the whatever they call the artisanal class, be, be lo, a little bit above the working class, but you don't have anybody working for you. I've never had anybody work for me, so no, of course not. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's one thing that happened with the demise of these restaurants. The next generation um, went on to uh, do other things, uh, and. Um, so it's hard to say what ha yeah when they they became the Jews in power, and then other all sorts of um, you know businesses they went into all sorts of businesses finan the financial industry, I mean I think it's some of the yeah people we see today who um, wanted to do, make do better, and. Uh, and I see that uh, I spend the, the summers in Europe, and f mainly in northern France, and there's still family restaurants, and these are young people running them, and the wife, you Yeah, know, but that French food, different. Yeah. Well, they have, <laughs> now they kind of opened up to other kinds of... But cuisine. probably no Balinces, probably. No, no, no Balinces, no. no. No, they're not Jewish restaurants. <laughs> but the idea that they could still... Uh, Somebody's in the the husband's in the kitchen, the wife is the waitress, and it were and it's a, and they try to make the best food they can afford to make, and uh, don't necessarily um, aspire to um, have other people working for them. They can't. The, the government. It's very hard to hire people there, and for, you know, to have employees. It's a very complicated thing, and very expensive. So you tend not to. Maybe a, a, even a child who works at a certain level has to be, uh, you know, on social security and everything. That's, yes, because that's because yeah. they pay people there. Yeah, they yeah. pay people. Here, we so. just don't pay anyone, and so. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, and so today I like, wor I mean, there are no shortage of, you know, working class restaurants in New York. Dominican restaurants down in Chinatown. And um, I like the aesthetic. Part of the aesthetics of a working class restaurant is, is the, they're more about utility. Everything is based on utility. Um, and some of the people I interviewed had no background in industrial design, but designed their own restaurants. And they're very simple. And it was a big issue. A lot of immigrant groups tried to have what they called ethnic decor. You know, Italian restaurants would have uh, plastic grapevines. Romanian restaurants would be decorated like a Romanian wine cellar. But these dairy restaurants had a very utilitarian look based, according to my theory, on the um, this... Um, the sanitary decor of a milk room that became the tiled luncheonette, the tiled wall, right, and later for mica countered, and it was about cleanliness and utility, and I was I like that too about a restaurant that it's um, not trying to make you think you're somewhere else. You're just where you are in this place. And I, I mean, I, did you eat in many of those other than the Ratners? Up I've seen Ratners at B&H Dairy, which is still there. Yeah, that's still there. Um, that, that's still a very utilitarian place. And there were lots of them in what yeah, used to be the garment district. Them. Right, yeah. You know, now it's not the garment district. Yeah. It's also not the dairy Hershey's restaurant. Hershey's was one on, uh, and uh, Geffen's opposite FIT. Right, but now Geffen's done much better. He doesn't work in the restaurant anymore. Oh, oh, that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's part of my interest in dairy restaurants—a kind of a lost thread of uh, a moment in Ju kind of Jewish culture, Eastern European facing. Um, uh, some maybe, uh, in some cases, uh, the politics of these places. By the time I went to them, was not. Overt, uh, they would advertise, you know, in the in the Freiheit or in the Forward. There was a kind of um, they were just interested in a diminishing clientele, getting anybody to come. 
but that um, that moment interested me a lot. I, I don't think I knew exactly what it was when I went to these places. They were just, I knew this was a, a world on the way out. <laughs> and I sort of liked that. So, um, uh, you know, if they were lucky, like the Ratners on Second Avenue, they were next to the Fillmore East, and they bisected the uh, counterculture of the 60s, which, in, you know, in its pastoral impulses, you know, uh, of the hippie culture, it has a lot to do with um, this history that I describe. Why people wanted to eat dairy food, and vegetarian food, the whole pastoral impulse, why people want to have country houses, all that stuff. So um, that's in the book. But it's, um, so if any historian who's an expert on any of this, these millions of things looks at this, uh, I mean, they'll be bewildered. They'll, they'll say, why, why? This person is not in my field. Why is he writing about this? And then the Jews who have this idea of a mythological unified culture will look at it and say, well, you left out, you left us out. It sort of ends with the end of your Eastern European, you know, leftist culture and these, wh what's going on here? Why don't you want to talk? And so um, I don't know who exactly who the audience is. There's a world now of these young, uh, there's a thing called, there's a whole Yiddish uh, cultural wor movement now among young people. Yiddish New York is an event that happens in December on Christmas. So you don't have to go to your, uh, to Christmas parties. You go to Yiddish New York and people are working in Yiddish again. And they're, they're interested in some of the, uh, politics associated with that. So it's things are coming around. That might be the audience for this book. I did a few talks there and they were kind of interested. So But this is your audience. That's why they came here. Oh that's true. <laughs> well I don't know. They didn't this read is, the book this yet. This is an actual audience. They bought wait a minute, they bought the book. They bought it based I think on my comic strips. Does it matter, Ben? Uh, okay. Why they bought it? Oh right, that's a third <laughs> that's a third that category. A third category is people who are going to read this book uh, lo imagining that it's an object in my world of comic, my imaginary world of Julius Knipple. That's a whole other category. That's also a good possibility. <laughs> so there are a few. You, but they're related, Ben, because yeah, you did them. Right. They are related. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's I, the author theory of being an author. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, in my comic strips, I've invented lots of books, like the the directory of the alimentary canal. I don't know if you yes, remember that. I remember. remember. There was a telephone book that came out, I forget, every two weeks, that listed the gastrointestinal, not a phone number, but the gastrointestinal condition of everyone in the city. <laughs> and you would just use it to know whether you should bother that person this week. <laughs> so, uh, but I've made up a lot of books like that. Yeah, I'm surprised I didn't catch on, really. That book, no. <laughs> but so this book, it actually fits into that mold of this impossible book. Like, there's some imaginary audience. Offhand, I can't think of others, um, but I did. I made up lots of strange books like that. But there's a real audience. Yeah. Right. Oh. Okay. Well, I, we're not. I'm not used to working a, a live audience. That's a different thing. But that's the other. Another issue about Jewish restaurant culture is that it was the place where talking happened, and uh, you know, some vast amount of um, Yiddish culture was spoken. It, people didn't write everything down. And so that's how I knew of you more as a, as a talker, this kind of rare But not in thing. Yiddish. No, not in <laughs> Yiddish, in English, but a rare <laughs> thing, like a person who doesn't have to think so much about like being in a newspaper every week and gets up and talks to an audience. And that's kind of... Um, Easier. I don't know. <laughs> Not for me. It wouldn't be easy for, for me. For me, it's easy. No, you were great at doing that. So uh, that's the other, another angle of restaurant culture. People were talking a lot while they were between eating, I guess. 
But I remember p hearing a lot. If you used to go to the Diamond Dairy on um, 47th Street, it was like the last place uh, you could easily, not in a, a non-Hasidic um, neighborhood where people were speaking Yiddish. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, um, that's it. That defines my, in this. so you could say, well, someone could look at this and say, this is an imaginary world you're talking about. This is not my world of Jews or Judaism. Um, but it's uh, it's a made up. It's an imagination, uh, and I think there are some. There's a famous um, uh, Yiddish historian, Simon Dubno, who said that's uh, my Judaism is history, <laughs> studying the history of Jews. I'm not in, interested in following the religion or the food. He was a fairly somewhat assimilated Jew, I think, and he said. That's my, um, the extent of my Judaism. And he, you know, that was a major body of work he wrote. He collected history. So I would say this falls into that category. Uh, a historical Jew, or the Jew who wants to uh, talk about history, and maybe it's ended. I, I don't see how it could... I don't know that this is going to spur a, a revival of dairy restaurants. <laughs> oh, that, not Eastern European. You know, there's still a million uh, dairy restaurants. Every kosher pizzeria is a dairy re is a uh, milchtika restaurant, but it's not an Eastern European dairy restaurant. And can it spur? I don't know. Maybe some of these young Yiddishists will start opening these places. I don't know. I don't know if they're enough. I think you need an, uh, you need a, when the neighborhood changed, uh, the garment district, uh, the demographic changed, or the Lower East Side, these places went out of business. You need a certain number of people right. to run a restaurant. customers who are alive. Yeah, yeah. eating yes. customers. Right? <laughs> right. We're gonna take questions from the audience, if you would like to ask them, and if not, we won't. <laughs> yes? Just curious about the research. Just where you found these trails and how you followed them? Like any researcher, and then, you know, li before the internet libraries, and I taught, tried to interview people, and I would look up people, and there were a few interviews with uh, people in the business. But the, um, there was um, a moment early on, on the, in the internet when Google was digitizing every book and made them all word searchable. They've since all been taken off for copyright reasons. But yeah. the, the information that I needed is in no index. Nobody would index it. There'd be a mention, and we ate in the dairy. And that was really useful, because all of this information was in books that have nothing to do with Jews or dairy restaurants. So how would I ever? So it almost needed the internet to find a lot of this stuff. And the, uh, what is that? All the genealogical data that's now been digitized, that's really useful. Hi, um, I just want to say that I've been following you since the New York press. I first saw your cartoons there. Yes. And I said, this guy knows the world that I know somewhere in my imagination. Some old New York, but not New York, some place where there's only eccentric building uh, businesses right. around, and uh, it's. A, th I think that this dairy restaurant concept and the concept of Jews that you and, and Fran are discussing are those kind of Jews that lived in this this New York world uh, that I vaguely remember uh, at my age, but that I'm very nostalgic for. And, and your work for me right. is is nostalgia. That, that's well, yeah, the, the, those strips, Julius Knippel did not take place in New York. I, it was an invented city like New York, but it never got into the real history of New York. This purports to be really about um, real places and real businesses. Not the myth, the beginning is myth, mythological. But um, yeah, it became New York, uh, after Warsaw became the largest um, pop collection of Eastern European Jews. So uh, 
That's what I grew up in. Yeah, and my, you know, I, my father was a Yiddish speaker from Warsaw. Yeah. Where does Yonah Shimon fit in? There's a ch section about it, and um, you know, I don't want to get into a, a lawsuit or, but. <laughs> Uh, there's a thing in Jewish, and uh, probably all ethnic um, restaurant businesses where people want to make it look like there's some uh, real um, lineage between an older restaurant and their restaurant. And it's very confusing in the case of Yoni Schimmel because uh, there were, I found some ads. Um, the, the family, so there was kind of a, another kind of rupture between... Um, a daughter and her son-in-law, a daughter and a son-in-law, and Yonis Schimmel. And at some point, he reopened this um, Knish Bakery on Avenue A, and there were ads saying, this is not to be confused with any other Yonis Sh person operating under the name Yonis Schimmel. So I don't think this history of the place that's there is that clear. And it's they like say raised pizza for Jews. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> like raised pizza. Yeah, Remember yeah, the original something raise, like that. know where the but, original uh, raised, they sued each other the, and yeah. they both went out of business because the lawyers got all the money. Yeah. <laughs> they, I mean the owners now claim it goes back four or five generations, but they don't explain what it is. So it's complicated. I never unwrap tried to interview them. So yeah. Do you remember the phrase shouted out by the wait staff at B and H Jerry Restaurant? Mm -hmm. If you tip more than a quarter, yeah, ja uh, jumbo jockey. Yes, yeah. so it was spoken yeah. by the Puerto Rican help. Yeah, it became jumbo jockey. Yeah, which is way better. Yeah, that was. There's a section about the B and H. Yeah, the B and H is interesting to me. I, I met my wife there. Uh, she wasn't my wife when I met her. She was a. Uh, a woman sat down next to me. This is not a, this is not completely in the book, for some reason. I was eating gefilte fish. Um, Always alluring. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I was just there a few a few days ago, and I asked the waiter, "Do you still have gefilte fish?" And he looked at me. He said, "We haven't had gefilte fish here for 25 years." <laughs> So anyway, we were eat I was eating gefilte fish, and a woman sat down next to me and said, what are you eating? What is that? What are you eating? And I explained it, and we met, and we, that's, and we ended up being married. But, but, um, but like then it, tur it, turns out, it turns out she knew what it was. She, she's Jewish. She knew what it was. And um, we both for some reason didn't think we would, the other person was Jewish, which is really strange. She said, you look, she thought I was Irish. Really? And I didn't know what she was, but we, she's, She thought so you I, were Irish? Yeah. You married? Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. You married Helen Keller? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know, it was 40 years ago. It's 44, how many years ago? 44. Yeah, 40, yeah, so I didn't look the way I looked. But anyway, any other questions? <laughs> it looks to me like there's going to be a tour in that art. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pro I don't know what's in there. Anyway, no, there's no tour, yeah. Okay, so the dairy restaurants were to separate milk and meat. Well, from a culinary point of view, but the, the dietary law behind all this, it could be separated from, the, from religious observance, just like lots of laws. People uh, don't know why, like why am I not supposed to eat human beings? I don't know why, what the you know, historical law is behind it is. So anyway, what, but what were you gonna say? <laughs> Protoast, Protoast egg, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a, a canned substance made by the Kellogg uh, company when it was a health food company. It was a nut, a nut protein concoction, looked like dog food. And you sliced it and you could make uh, vegetarian chopped liver, you could 
cook it in different ways. It was you couldn't a, eat it, though. It was a non... <laughs> <laughs> you could eat it. No, it was a non... Um, what do you call it? They, like all the fake meat they make today. But, uh, but no, it wasn't... If you look at the American dairy restaurants, there was a whole phenomenon of American non-Jewish things called dairy lunch, dairy restaurants. The food wasn't... The dairy food, although you'd think it would be cheaper, wasn't. The, you, the prices are comparable to meat. So it wasn't necessary. It was easier to chew. Somebody said <laughs> that was a big thing. People had trouble with their teeth. And dairy food was softer, maybe. So. Yeah. Uh, we just lost the uh, Iron Shapiro. Uh, we lost an old yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Did you uh, agree when you describe the difference in the culture? The, the, the difference, it, go, it goes back to these, the ancient world. The meat eaters were appetitive brutes, and the, non -meat, the vegetable and milk eaters were, were more uh, passive, um, you know, ruminative people. That's an ancient, it goes back to the ancient world. I mean, and yeah, I think the businessmen in the garment district all week ate in a delicatessen and then from when they had heartburn one day a week they would go eat in a dairy restaurant so it was yeah to escape the world the appetitive world i mean I, yeah well, i'm not summing up a friend i just told you the uh, earlier to the uh, country of the coat sellers you can see that i i, did, I haven't seen it I know I'm in it. I know. I, uh, I, I remember doing it. It was a couple years ago. It looks fantastic. Oh, thank you. Uh, then, uh, you mentioned in passing that you were working on this in 2005. When did you first... Oh, way before. Uh, since the eight, I was thinking about this in the 80s. I was interviewing the last of living uh, restaurateurs from the 80s. But there was no pressure... Uh, to finish this because I knew I, I didn't know the full the story I kind of outline in this book and um, the only pressure was I started to worry that the public books would end or something especially when ebooks started I thought if I don't get this out that my publisher is going to just say it's too late you waited too long but uh, yeah I've been thinking about it not as a book as re pure research for, for 30 years or something. Yeah, a long time. That's not that long. Yeah. No, a lot of books. I did get interested in learning about long-standing, unfulfilled book contracts. The whole history. And I think most of them, after like 20 or 30 years, they never happen. So this one did happen. So it's kind of the rare, long... Um, and my editor... Uh, I guess the in I inherited a few editors over those decades. They understood that I was working on it. I mean, and it, it's not a topical. Would it have helped if it came out 20 years earlier? I don't think. I don't think. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to ask Fran if you still have your checker cab. I do. Yeah, all right, great. It's not a cab, though. Oh, it's a, no, it's, a it's a checker marathon. It was a passenger car that the checker cab company made. Um, I still have it. I'm the I'm the only owner. I was the original owner. I bought it new in 1978. It's a, it's a 79. Um, it's in perfect condition. Um, it is. Uh, it has its own apartment. Um, <laughs> it is the only monogamous relationship of my life. <laughs> um, so I do still have it. I want to ask Ben, is Mr. Nipple retired or is it? Knip yeah, it's Knipple. It's pronounced Knipple. No, he, it's finished. I, I uh, haven't done that for years. Is he retired? You mean in the story? No, he's still working. In the story, he's still. But are you going to ever. No, I'm not making them anymore. I've done other strips since then, other weeklies and um, monthlies. And I was working on this book for a. Uh, the last uh, few years, I haven't done a regular strip, but I should probably. It's just, but yeah, but not Knipple. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, I think you asked. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're every month in Metropolis? No, I was until uh, for 13 years, and then I think they just asked me to stop. 
can you release a book of those? Yeah, there is. It's called, they must have it here. Hand drying in America, it's called. There is a collection. 13 years. Yeah, back there. If you retire Julius Nipple, uh, do you have any ideas for other uh, characters? Oh. oh I've, I've got a suggestion for a name. Okay. okay. Herman Epis. Yeah, okay, that's a good. No, there were three or four other series of weekly strips after Knipple. Hotel, uh, the Cardboard Valise, Hotel and Farm. There was something called Shoehorn Technique. There were all these strips. So yeah, there's no shortage of strips. Uh, but that's not bad. A Yiddish name, yeah. Urban Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, no, I just don't. I always liked the idea that a book would start the minute you open it. I, I mean, end papers just seem like a some weird wrapper that was unnecessary. I never liked the kind of what do you mean repetitive? No, it never seemed to make much sense to me from a from a storytelling point of view. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, a more introspective question, if you accept it. Uh, what do you think about your interest in lost worlds? Uh, maybe it's because, uh, you know, if you don't, you think you're in a fallen version of those worlds, you want to look back to them and say, what went wrong? <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I think that's another part of this book. I don't know if that's nostalgia or political activism. I don't know what it is, but I look back and I like the idea that there was a moment when, uh, in, in New York, when um, people, there was this Jewish working class. Whatever the aesthetic of the, there's a whole debate. I don't know if any of you know about, um, you know, in the 20s and 30s, proletariat literature. And like people said, well, if you like it so much, then that argues for there not being a socialist or a communist revolution. You're in love with this thing, the working class. Why do you want to disrupt it? And so that's a good question, because no, people didn't know what would replace it. Would it be, how could it be better? I mean, there are inklings of it, you know, post-revolutionary Russia first few years, all those amazing movies. You could say that's not, they kind of didn't want it to be working class, but it was uh, looking to some other model. I, I don't know, but that's a really important question. If you don't like the culture you're in, like what do you propose? You know? It's been replaced by the coronavirus. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one of the things that's interesting about this book is it's so meticulously reported, it's so fact-based, it's so right. thorough, it's so careful. Not that the other the other books aren't, well, but it seems a very different aesthetic from the yeah. last week. On the other hand, your your book on instruction manuals is poetry. Oh, oh yeah. It was also meticulously reported. So I, I, I wonder whether you could say a word about Yeah. That. Well, my favorite Art, I think, is found art, where nobody sets themselves up to have made it. They make it by accident. They say something that's just so brilliant or accidental art. You know, the whole world of found poetry. And this book, I could have said compiled by Ben Catcher. A lot of it is quotations. I mean, it, it almost didn't have to say that I wrote it. You could say, I want it to be make it feel like not in my, uh, some kind of voice of mine. I, I wanted it to feel like a, an encyclopedia uh, entry. So It's an authentic elementary canal encyclopedia. Yeah, it, I mean, I think it, it's what, I, I was, I told somebody, it's one of my favorite books. I have these old um, yellow pages from 1940s from Chicago, and they're amazing illustrated directories of a city with nobody trying to be an author but people coming up with these crazy trade names and little descriptions and it's pure poetry. No poet could come up with that quantity of poetry, I don't think. So, yeah, that's... So read it with that in mind as a piece of found... Uh, a kind of a compilation. There might be a couple of 
poetic moments, but they're by accident. I didn't, I didn't set out to write it uh, uh, like I would write a strip that works like a little haiku or something. It wasn't my intention. Yeah. What, your, what is your uh, interviewing technique? Do you record people? Uh, yeah, I did use uh, tape recorders. Um, what do you do with the tapes after? I have them. I've transcribed some of them, the ones that I used. Uh, I don't know. I think they're disintegrating. You know, they're old, real, uh, what do you call cassettes. I don't think they're, I don't know how, I haven't looked at them lately, but. And I have one more question. What, what kind of food do you like? What, what kind of food? I, I mean, I like um, good, something that's well prepared. <laughs> I mean, I like all kinds of food, but if, it, if it's done badly, I think it's a matter of how it's done. So there are things, yeah, that's just what I've found. I, it's hard to say, you know, that it, there's only a certain, I have very broad tastes in food, but it has to be like a good version of it, because there's a lot of bad food, uh, uh, bad versions of food, you know. Like, the chances are if you go into a, um, a Polish restaurant, maybe the, the pierogi will be too leaden or too heavy. But that's so, but that changes depending on the chef. So, right. It's strange to talk about food like it's divorced. Somebody had to make it. So you'd have to say, what's the best kind of chef that I like? What, I like a good chef, <laughs> not a bad chef. Thank you very much. Right. Good night. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming, uh, have a great night.